You're a stalker. I don't know what to tell you. Call yeah. the police. She <laughs> <laughs> is a stalker. Hello. Welcome to a new reading vlog for the month. We are starting this month off in San Francisco with my girlfriend. She's visiting for the week, so I'm gonna be showing her around the city. We're gonna be buddy reading a few books. One of them's gonna be a graphic novel, the other is a romance book. And then after that, I'm gonna be flying to New York. I'm subleasing a friend's place. I'll be in Brooklyn, so I will take you along with me as I continue to read and explore the city. I'm excited for what we're gonna do in this vlog and what we're gonna read. And before we get into that, I wanna say thank you to today's sponsor. Cue the clip from Future Cindy. Future Cindy here reporting to you from Japan. By the time I post this, there will be a book coming out called Organ Meats by K. Ming Chang. This book comes out on October 24, just in time for spooky season. It is K. Ming Chang's latest novel. And if you aren't familiar with the author, they have actually won a Lambda Literary Award for their previous novels before. But this book is perfect for all the feral girlies out there. If you are into literary fiction that has a speculative twist, and if you're into surrealism and queer characters, like in Everything Everywhere All at Once, then you would be into this novel. This is about two best friends. They are literally bound together by this red string that's tied around their necks and their ancestors, who are generations of dog-headed women and women-headed dogs. If you are interested in checking out this book alongside me, I will have a link in my description below. Now, let's go ahead and go back to the reading vlog. We're gonna do a little mini book haul because today we visited Silver Sprocket, which is Victoria's favorite bookstore. We actually discovered this bookstore by accident because we were on our way to a different bookstore. And when we were walking, we saw the cutest graphic novel shop and it was very queer. It had a lot of indie comics. I got four graphic novels. First one I got is Crab Apple Trouble. The art is just so precious. I like the colors. They're so pretty. Honestly, I would put this art on my wall. It's so cute. You mean on the, the art on the cover? Mm hmm Next I got Nera in the Gin. So sorry if I'm butchering that. It's super, super cute. It's a lot more uh, pastel, like with pinks and purples. <gasps> Lesbians. I was about to say, mm. <laughs> I got Cosmo Knights, which the art just looks super, super beautiful. For this ragtag band of space gays, liberation means beating the patriarchy at its own game. The woman on the back definitely looks gay too. Yeah, she does. Look at that. It's the smirk. She's not. <laughs> I got this book because I saw this sticker and I was like, I love this. And I was like, is this based on something? And they said, yes. And they were like, it's coming out soon. We're not supposed to sell them to you, but because you're here and you don't live here, we'll sell it to you in secret. Thunder and lightning. To fight is to live, to fight is to die, to fight is to become something unknown. And I like how it has a very like neon pink and black. Also the two characters on the cover have similar hairstyles to Victoria and me. It's always that way though. <laughs> I'm always like, that's you, babe, on every gay media I interact with. Ooh. Ooh. Show them that, show them that. This is cool. <laughs> this one definitely seems to be the edgiest of the books you've gotten. Oh, for sure. A book that we are gonna read together. Well, for me, it's reading for the first time. For you, it's rereading because you really like this book. It is The Cursed Princess Club. It's so cute and hilarious. Like, it's so funny. Wait, is that the main character? Yeah, that's The Cursed Princess. Oh, okay. I'm starting to get it now. <laughs> she's these... like, she's cute in her own way though. So there's these characters and the main character is this bitch right here. Hey. <laughs> we love her. It's okay. This would be me if I were a princess. Nah. -uh. I like that her flowers are dying too. That's me with every plant that comes my way. So we will keep you updated as we read throughout the week.
hello we are back looking very crusty ah. but you know what in line with the theme of appearing crusty but not caring anyway we read the curse princess club which is about the main character who looks like a crusty fugly bitch Stop. and she gets accepted anyway she does not look like a fugly <laughs> crusty bitch don't listen to her she's cute she just doesn't look like her sister. If she's still cute, doesn't that defeat the purpose of the message, which is that it doesn't really matter how princesses look like? It doesn't matter how they look like. They can look all different, but that doesn't mean she's not pretty. It's essentially these three princesses that are in the pastel kingdom. Their father betrothes them to three princes in the plaid kingdom. They're like meeting for the first time. Two of the sisters are super happy and they're like stereotypically traditionally pretty and they're very happy with their matches. But then the youngest prince thinks that he's matched with the brother who was in the portrait that they saw. The prince thought that the brother in the portrait was a girl because he's so pretty. So when he finds out that it's actually this green, less traditionally pretty <laughs> princess, he's not thrilled. He's not excited. He's like, I don't want to be with this fuggo. <laughs> <laughs> but we learn why he's not nice. It's because he's a loser. No. No, that was literally the explanation. Yeah, but it's, he, it's trauma. We learn through his background story, he calls himself a loser because the other two princes had been always raised as like the most handsome one, the most popular one. He is like the less traditionally masculine one. He's well, just according to his that. father. He says some really mean things. Pretty much like calls him like worthless, spineless, unmanly, like whatever. Why can't you be? like your brother's mm -hmm. kind of period father <laughs> hey, don't say that she ends up meeting all these different princesses who have been cursed so there's one with like lobster claws because they used to be a lobster <laughs> and now they're a princess my favorite princess is the girl who looks very cutesy but then she like lifts up her eyes, because it turns out she just has like- It's a, like hollow in there. Yeah, just like a gaping hole where her eyes should be. <laughs> and I was like, that's metal as fuck. Yeah, she's really cool. We read this book together in two sittings. I, I remember when you were reading it, you kept telling me there were so many moments where you laughed out loud. Anytime I read a certain line, like I'll know this is gonna be when Victoria laughs. And then I read it and then you're like, <laughs> You didn't laugh! <laughs> We're gonna see if we can continue buddy reading some more, so I will update you for next time. Bye. You mess with me, boy. You are the cause of all my stress. You been ignoring all my texts. While we eat some Mexican food, I started this audiobook called Astrid Parker Doesn't Fail. The only reason why I read it was because you were reading it and now I'm fully caught up to you. Mm -hmm. It's about these two gays. <laughs> One of them bumps into another one at a coffee shop and like ruins her dress and she has a very like Karen moment and it's like you're gonna pay for my dry cleaning and blah blah blah. The other one's like about to like break down into tears because she feels so bad. Ashton is a designer, like the interior designer and Jordan is the carpenter who makes all this stuff. Turns out they're gonna end up being essentially co-workers on a house renovation TV show. When the lady in charge sees like their banter or whatever, she's like, oh, this is good. We're gonna amp this up and yada, yada, yada. She's like, so I'm gonna give the gays everything they want. <laughs> when I first started listening to the audiobook, 
when they met up by them bumping into each other and then Astrid like yelling at Jordan because her dress got ruined. I was really turned off by that because mm -hmm. she was a huge bitch. Yeah, she was. She was giving Karen too, especially with like the short blonde hair and she's very like prim and proper. Yeah. And she's like, give me your address so I can bill you for the dry cleaning. <laughs> and I'm like, ew. And I was telling you about that. You were like, yeah, but there's a reason she's like that. And I was like, okay, well, obviously, yeah, because you don't treat other people that way unless you have some, you know, internal shit going on. Yeah. I don't know, it was a turn off. But then as I kept on reading, her lashing out. I mean, she does feel bad about it later. That was like a breaking point. Like that's not her everyday, like yeah. how she talks to people. But because it was my first introduction to her, yeah. I was like, You did Ew. not like her. Yeah, I, that's so fair. Anyway, sadly, of course, a character who I think is a bitch and I was turned off by, I end up relating to her later on. Ain't that always the case? Yeah. I'm like constantly stressed and I'm constantly on edge. But I will say, no matter how stressed and frustrated I am, I will never bitch out at a stranger like that. I would say we're like 70% through the book. They're cute and everything. Glad they're getting along and learning how to work together. But I want to talk about the previous relationship Ugh. that Jordan has. Please. I will put a sticker or some text to indicate that they are spoilers. So you can just hop off to the next part if you want to avoid it. But if you don't care about spoilers and you want to hear the tea about Jordan's previous relationship, we're going to mm -hmm. discuss it right now. Now, okay, so the T is Jordan was previously married mm -hmm. to another woman. Yeah, they were like high school sweethearts. They dated, they got engaged, they got married, but then Jordan's wife ended up getting cancer. Mm -hmm. Jordan was very supportive the entire time through all of the chemotherapy and the surgeries and everything. It's challenging not just for the person who has cancer, but like the loved one who is taking care of you while oh, you extremely. are. Oh, extremely. I think a lot of people don't think about that, but yeah. like. That's extremely taxing in every way. Yeah, it's very physically and emotionally demanding. Yeah. Um, but she was willing to put in the work and- Well, she loved her. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, so she did all that. Fortunately, the wife did not die of cancer. She ended up recovering and now she's cancer free. However, due to that whole experience, it really changed her whole perspective on life. And she basically decided she no longer wanted to be with Jordan. She just has like different priorities in life now. She wants to experience other things in life so she ended up leaving Jordan. I feel like it's also devastating in a different way to not like nothing happened in the sense of like nobody cheated yeah nothing there was no like infidelity or like abuse she just d decided she didn't want to be with you anymore and it's not even that she didn't love you. She just wanted something else in life. At the same time though, I also understand where Meredith is coming from, where it's like, even if you were together for so long, if you start to realize that you want different things, it's better to decide to depart from the relationship rather than forcing it and dragging it along and making it more painful for both you and the other person. However, what is so weird about this Meredith character is that she, every now and then, will text Jordan and be like, hey, how's it going, thinking about you I want to be in town you want to hang out blah 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 and I'm just like girl when I tell y'all I hate her <gasps> like I, f I hate her I hate her she's a cancer patient because <laughs> not anymore <laughs> <She's in rubbish. laughs> if both of you want to be friends that's fine but if you want to be friends and the other person does not want to be friends and they've made that perfectly fucking clear you need to stop like at a certain point, you need to stop. Yeah, because Jordan wasn't replying to any of her for texts. For years, it's happened for years. That's just weird. So the fact that she's like still constantly texting her, like she needs to read the room. She's sitting there texting her, being like, oh yeah, like just saw like in Paris, like da -da -da. like she's like telling her how great her life is. And poor Jordan is sitting here heartbroken, miserable, broke, living with her family, sleeping on the couch. All of her jobs have been like failing. She's like rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And imagine you're rock bottom. And then this bitch just like texting you like a paragraph about how great her life is since she dumped your ass. No, mm. no. She's like, you have, no. to, you have to try the croissants in Paris. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Like, like, what are you saying? That's what I find is so weird about it. Shut up. I was listening to audiobook today, and then where I let off was the two main characters getting frisky, and then somebody shows up. Guess who shows up? Fucking Meredith. She shows up Fucking unexpected. Meredith. Because she was in town, and by in town, she meant the other place that they used to live. This bitch shows up to where she used to live, knocks on the door. Those people tell her that she moved away. She then gets a hold of her new address and goes there. You're a stalker. I don't know what to tell you. Call yeah. the police. <laughs> <laughs> like, she is a 
stalker. Call the ambulance, but not for the cancer. Because <laughs> I'm about to beat this. <laughs> if you broke someone's heart like that, you need to just be respectful of them and their pain and what they're going through. And if they're ready to talk to you and like form a connection with you again, they will. You, yeah. you can't just like force it. If that had been me in real life, I would have been like literally kick her off the property right now. Yeah. Wow. I hope I never get cancer if that's how you're going to treat me. She may have gotten rid of that tumor, but there's still one more. And it's her being a bitch. <laughs> Stop it. Well, next time I update you, I will let you know how the adventures of Astrid Parker discovering Cunnilingus will go. Bye. What happens when the world ends? At least this is an okay bar for running into you. It's an awful house, and I wanted to get you out. I'm working on a plan right now to come through. I've waited for. because I am subleasing an apartment in New York. This is basically gonna be the place that I stay while I apartment hunt for my permanent place because I'm looking to finally move to New York. That means you will no longer see me jumping around in different backgrounds every video because I am for once looking for stability. But in the meantime, I really like where I'm staying. This is Monica's apartment. She's another booktuber and she happened to be traveling out of country and needed someone to sublease her apartment and I just thought that it was the perfect opportunity to have another excuse to go to New York. So during my flight here, I finished reading Astrid Parker Doesn't Fail. And let me tell you, after all the shit talking that Victoria and I did about Meredith, that character does something on chapter 30 that I know will piss off Victoria when she gets to that point. If you've read it, you know what I mean. It's just like the audacity of this character. I just find it so weird when people have no understanding of boundaries and they pull some heinous shit. And that is exactly what happened in this book. And then obviously we have the third S conflict that occurs in pretty much almost every story. I pretty much expected that to happen, but what I was kind of shocked by was Astrid telling her love interest, fuck you. And this isn't even the first time I've seen a main character say that to their love interest in a romance book, because the same thing happened in one of Allie Hazelwood's books too. I always get so shocked whenever couples say that in arguments, because that seems like such an irreparable thing to say to someone. Like I would never say that to Victoria, and if she ever said that shit to me, my feelings would be so hurt. I'm just like, damn, y'all are really saying anything, huh? Anyway, now that I finished the book, I did think that it was sweet to see the main character's story arc being about her embracing more of what she actually wants to do in her life rather than forcing herself to do something that she clearly doesn't care for. People nowadays encourage you to quit jobs if you're unhappy in it and pursue more romantic things like baking or starting a coffee shop or whatever. But the problem is I'm not skilled at anything else. So what is a struggling girl boss supposed to do here? I have two other books that I want to update this vlog with. I'll try to make it short because they weren't like books that I particularly cared for, but at least the cover for this one is pretty. So this is a new book called House of Cotton. I think I need to accept that gothic books are just not for me because I've tried so many throughout this year and they have not been hidden. But if you are into gothic books, especially ones that explore race and trauma, then you might be into this one. It is about a 19 year old woman who's basically like an orphan. Orphan. She's struggling through life. She's broke. She has a predatory landlord. Basically the quintessential New York experience, except I think this one takes place in like middle America. The plot begins when she is approached by this stranger who offers her this modeling job at his family's funeral home, which already sounds sketchy. But then when you dive into her doing the modeling, basically she's dressing up as the dead people so that their loved ones can pretend to talk to the person that passed away. And she has to like mimic their mannerisms and give 
enough generic responses to satisfy the loved ones who are talking to her like that. It is such a weird setup, but she's just trying to get her back, so she just rolls with it. And then the other book that I read was via audiobook, and it was called How Not to Kill Yourself, because I have been going through it. I don't think you should take the title literally, because I don't consider this to be like a self-help book. I see it as more of like a series of essays and reflections from the author where he talks more about his life and his experiences with suicide. He has attempted it so many times. He's also a philosophy professor, so he takes a lot of different interpretations of suicide from different philosophers and puts them together and tries to make sense of why so many people do this rather than it really being like self-help or whatever. If anything, I could kind of see it being triggering. Like if you are in the mindset of considering that, you probably shouldn't read this book. On a lighter note and a much less depressing note, I'm going to be switching over to reading Ali Hazelwood's newest book, Love Theoretically. I know my bookish choices are jumping all over the place, but hopefully next time I see you, I will have much lighter topics to talk about. And also hopefully by then I will have more of my shit together. So see you then. That I'm afraid, but we can make it go. Cool.